I just had a great conversation with Lauren Ambo. She is the deputy superintendent of Friendswood ISD. It's a, a community just outside Houston, Texas, where NASA has some really incredible things that are going on there. And I've, it's just an incredible district. And one of the things that we talked about is this idea of vulnerable, and courageous, and authentic leadership. And one of the things I've been thinking about since the podcast, since we recorded it, and I, I always try to take some time to reflect on what we just talked about, is we say we often really appreciate authenticity, but then we also gravitate to curated experiences on social media. And what I mean by this, I and I maybe I'm talking about myself, maybe this is my own struggle, which is why I like talking about it, is, you know, a lot of times I'll share pictures of me working out of the gym and... Uh, and uh, I, I do that, to hopefully, to kind of inspire people to like go to the gym. But I don't really worry about the angles. I don't really worry about, you know, having someone do the photos for me and stuff like that. I think there's a time and a place. But then I also see people, you know, saying we want authenticity, but then gravitating towards, um, you know, pictures where you obviously know someone with the photographer comes in and takes pictures with the family and, you know, just kind of doing the stuff that it looks like they're just having fun and joy, but obviously, you know, it's kind of being put on for a camera so they can share on social media and it doesn't feel very authentic to me. But then a lot of times that's what people gravitate towards is a curated experience, the things that look perfect. And why I struggle with this is because do we allow for authenticity in our world today outside of our spaces? Do we say we want a vulnerable leader, but then we see weakness and then we criticize it. And so how do we kind of rectify those things in our heads? And and like, what do we say we want and what do we show we want? And do they actually connect? And what is it telling our kids? We have this concern that kids, you know, see these curated experiences that they can't live up to. And one of the things I, I remember saying to a group is that when you look at social media, you have to understand it's often... ESPN Sports Center. It's not the whole game. It's the highlights. And we have to think about that. But do we gravitate towards the highlights or do we actually want people to see the whole game? In the spirit of authenticity, I wanted to share things I'm struggling with. But hopefully you enjoy this podcast. I really push my thinking. I love talking to Lauren. So welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I'm so blessed today to have Lauren Ambo, who is the Deputy Superintendent of Friendswood ISD, which is just outside, right? It's just outside Houston, right? Hello, yeah. Friendswood ISD. Oz, love, love Friendswood, my Friendswood peeps, right? And, we, and, so, and we love you. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I love everybody there too. They're super welcoming to me. And, uh, uh, I have actually been to friends with a couple of times and the um, I know uh, Thad very well. He's a superintendent. Him and I actually connected not only on a professional level, but a personal level. We have a love for sports and, uh, uh, you know, our, our families and stuff. And so that is really great to be there. But uh, Lauren is talks a lot about leadership. We've had really great conversation before the podcast. And sometimes I, I like wish I'd record those things, but I think that I, I don't know if I can. Uh, if people are allowing me to publish what we talk about before, but yeah, like it is really the, your passion for leadership, your passion for public education, for teachers, for kids um, is really inspiring and I absolutely love it. And so um, Lauren, if you could just kind of introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what you do today and how you got there. That's a great place to start. Sure. Yes. Again, so Lauren Ambo, super excited to be here with you guys today. Um, as George pointed out, I serve as the Deputy Superintendent and Friends at ISD currently, so have the privilege of really supporting uh, an incredible teaching and learning team, supporting um, instructional coaches, supporting kind of curriculum and instruction um, at the K-5 level, and also this year have the privilege of supporting some pretty rock star campus principals and, and assistant principals. So leadership truly is a passion of mine. Um, I, I think uh, serving in public education does not come without its challenges in today's times, mm -hmm. and so really have discovered, even, you know, especially post post pandemic, um, just this idea of um, the increasing value of courageous and vulnerable leadership in public education. So this idea of reimagining what leadership can look like to really bring public schools um, kind of out of the state of crisis to really staying relevant um, for our students today. 
So tell, okay, the, I, there's a word that you said right away, and I want you to really kind of break it down for me when you say it, because I think sometimes in education, we're guilty of saying stuff that is said, but then not necessarily backing it up or doing what that thing is. You, you said, I am lucky to serve. Mm-hmm. So when you, when you think of that terminology, because like, I, I understand that terminology when you say serve, but also deputy superintendent, like you're, you're basically second in charge. So, you know, you have tons of authority if someone does something wrong, you know, like it's going to eventually fall upon you. So what does that mean, especially in that role where, you know, you do have that authority where, you know, if something goes wrong, um, you're going to have to deal with it. What does that look like when you say that term serve? Gosh, you know, I, I can firmly say I wouldn't be in this position if, if I wasn't able to serve. So to serve to me means that all those folks that I named, teachers, instructional coaches, campus administration, our students, our community, um, I have an obligation and a responsibility uh, to ensure their safety to help support their success, to hear them, to create conditions where they feel heard. Um, It's this, it's really this idea of um, leadership for me has never been about position or title. In fact, I tend to shy away from opening any presentation or speech with my title. I think uh, trust and respect is earned. I'm not super impressed by titles myself. I'm always impressed by the hearts of people around me. Um, and so honestly, service for me is really about showing up and being in the, and being, and being in the presence of all stakeholders that I have the privilege of interfacing with daily um, and, and really saying, if this is our goal and this is our vision, how can I serve you in getting there? Your success is my job, right? I want to partner with you in that. So um, really service from, from all angles, um, whether it's serving someone emotionally, whether it's uh, serving as, you know, a coach, a listener, um, but for me, the people are why I'm here, right? So uh, I'll tell you what gets me up in the morning is the people. It's certainly not the programs or the things, the compliance tasks. Um, the people are why I ch- continue to choose this profession daily. Well, it's actually so one of the things is actually funny. Um, when uh, I was there, Thad introduced me, and I remember they, they were asking me, what, like, how would you like to be introduced? I said, just tell like a story or be yeah. funny. I said, I said, even like, you know, make, if you make a joke at my expense, I'm totally good with that. Right. Like kind of knock me down a peg, uh, in the eyes of the people doing that because, uh, a lot of times when someone goes to speak to a district or speak at a conference, they'll be like, well, this person won this award and this person won this award and all this other stuff. And I'm like sitting there, I'm like, Oh, like who's this big shot. Right. right? It almost actually like elevates them to, to, and and it it elevates them in a way that not is not necessarily beneficial to when they actually start talking. Right. And I'd say like the more informal, the better, because, you know, if I'm terrible, uh, you know, as a speaker or, you know, in that role, no one's going to go, well, they did win that award. So, (laughs) right? Like nobody cares. Right. right. And it's the same thing is right. I'm going to try my best to like earn that respect Mm -hmm. and appreciation during the time that I have with that group, because it it almost is like lower the bar, like lower the bar. Let me work up to something. Don't, don't try to like, cause it's almost like that. I think that that's a really important aspect because a lot of times it's, um, you know, you see Twitter bios, like I won this, I won this, I won this, I won this. And it's like, it almost like, does the opposite of credibility in in some eyes, right? I don't I don't know. Maybe that's just a me thing. I don't know. No, I agree. I, I think the more layers we put in between those that we serve, like through titles and right. through awards and through accolades and so called <laughs> achievements, I think it it makes it harder to really foster that authentic relationship to really get to this level where we can where we can serve, right? And so right. I am I am totally with you, George. I um, have always just really enjoyed being in the presence of people being, um, at the same level, learning from them. I mean, there's not a presentation I do or go to or a learning opportunity that I sit alongside or am even facilitating where I am not looking to grow from those in front of me, right? I'm not looking to right. grow from those alongside me, which again, I think is what calls me back to this profession is this, I'm just surrounded by such brilliance, such unique ideas and, um, innovations daily that keep me going. Well, it's funny because actually, uh, you saw me at TASA this past year. Yes. And, um, and, and I was, I was the closing keynote for the conference, which is, you know, and maybe I don't like awards cause I've never won one. Maybe that's yeah. why, <laughs> maybe that's why. <laughs> so I was like, Oh, you won an award. Lucky you. Yeah, so one of the nicest compliments I got, cause I actually didn't just show up for the closing keynote. I was there for the whole event. 
And I tried to do that as much as possible. I'm actually speaking at a Georgia EdTech conference coming up. And I actually asked them, can I come early so I can see the opening keynote? Because I want to see what's going on, right? Yep. And uh, I remember specifically, you know, working in uh, the work of John Maxwell and Nikki Johnson into what I was sharing because, and somebody actually said, you know, it was really nice to see George um, actually there learning from the other people. Like, I remember that specifically was one of the tweets. And I was like, I, I took great pride in that too, right? Because like, I always talk about how I'm a learner. But yes. then for me just to show up, not listen to anybody, and then walk away after I'm done talking oh, yeah. isn't really embodying what I'm, I'm saying. Sure. Well, I think what we noticed too, George, I hope you don't mind me uh, sharing this, but I think one of the things that really struck our team is we were waiting to kind of get into that big kind of hall, you know, that, that big yeah. convention kind of space for the for the presentation was you were actually outside the door, you know, 15 minutes ahead of time greeting greeting those that are waiting to hear from you, right? Like greeting those that are waiting to be filled up. And I mean, just you being in their space, being at their level, and actually you held the door. So you like were walking on stage when all of us were seated. So again, I think that I've really tried to model that too, is when folks are coming to any professional learning or uh, how do, gosh, how we start, right? How do we show up, right? How do we ensure that they know like, it is, I am here for you, right? I'm here to learn from you as well. And I feed off of your energy and your questions. And I think that's what we felt from you and saw modeled by you on that on that day as well. Well, that that's funny because that is something that I learned from my mom and dad who own a restaurant, right? Like yeah. how, like, and you, that I think that's probably why I really connected to that word because yes. my parents literally, that was their, the way that they saw it was to, was to serve, right? right? Like, and if you think about it in a restaurant, that's probably yeah. the best word. and. Um, but people just had such a respect for them, such an admiration for them. And, uh, what they said was like really held close to people because of how they served and how they made people feel. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually could tell you straight up that I learned much more, um, from my mom and dad running a restaurant on how to lead in a school than I did in, in some educational, you know, sure. master's programs too, right. Just to yeah. see how they interacted with people. And that, that made a, a huge difference to me. Uh, I, I do want to ask you, and when you talk about this uh, terminology of being like, because I know vulnerable is a big um, aspect of when you talk about leadership and you talk about, you know, the, the need for courage. What do those things mean to you? And like, how, do, how is that actually beneficial to leadership? Yeah. So I, I think one of um, some of my greatest pieces of learning and probably greatest um, kind of things that I admire most about leaders I, I'm, I'm really watching and, and observing in this time in education. So vulnerable to me means leaders that are willing to stand up and say, look, you know, we're trying to reimagine public education. We're trying to provide opportunities for a voice and choice for students outside of a just a number grade or a standardized test score. And as leaders, we may not have all the answers on how to get there, but we are vulnerable enough to stand up. I would say vulnerable and courageous enough to stand up alongside the team that we have gathered to say, we believe in this. I'm not exactly sure how to get there, but man, let's start, let's start taking the steps forward. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, another word that really can, for me, I connect with vulnerability is this, this idea of humility. Um, humility is a really important character trait to me personally as a leader. And it really goes back to this idea of, of, of being a servant or really, really serving this idea that vulnerable leaders are willing to surround them, surround themselves with folks that are way more talented than them, that, uh, they're willing to not be the smartest person in the room, but they're willing to say like, man, let's come together. Let's collaborate on a shared vision and shared beliefs that we all have voice in and let's all add to ideas on how we're going to get there. Right. Um, and so really this idea of, I think there's a misnomer in leadership, George, honestly, that leaders have all the knowledge and all the skills already that we just possess these things. Right. And then, gosh, what's the point of the team then? Right. Mm -hmm. and so when I speak of vulnerability and, and I think of about where we're heading in public education and what are the possibilities of where we can head, Gosh, I just think about these courageous leaders who are standing up and saying, look, I don't have all the answers, but I need you on right. my team. We can shape this together. Like I actually was really thinking about that term courage this past week, right? Uh, yeah. As you know, we moved to Florida, Hurricane Ian. Yes. And uh, it was kind of interesting because I was thinking about this because I'm from Canada, right? Like yeah. hurricanes are not a Canada no. thing. I, even though actually it, it, on the East coast of Canada, a hurricane actually just, I think it was hurricane Fiona actually hit uh, part of the Maritimes in yeah. Canada just recently. Right. But where I was like there, you know, there's occasional tornado and stuff like that, but it's very, very rare. And, um, one of the reasons we moved to central Florida was, 
hey, that's kind of not hurricane area. So like we're, we can make that move. We don't want to move to the coast. Right. And, and it was like, I was really kind of thinking about that word specifically because I, I felt this need to protect my family and to protect my kids. And like, even some, in some ways to protect them from the knowledge of what was about to happen. Uh Like, Hey, like, I don't want to get you scared about what could happen. Right. But I'm also like, I'm freaking out a little bit too. So it was like really kind of thinking about it's not courage is not necessarily the absence of fear, but it's actually the ability to, to face it. Right. Yeah. And to, yeah. you know, to support others too. Right. Cause like uh, we actually, uh, um, one of the things we don't in, a, in the house, we actually, the, the safest place with the fewest windows is actually the room I'm sitting in right now is right. my office and it is not a, not a place to sleep. So I took mattresses and we came in here and it's like not ideal. I'm like to my daughters, I'm like, we're having a slumber party tonight. We're all going to sleep together. We're going to watch some TV for a little bit. And they were so excited about that. And when I'm like, oh my God, I'm like checking Google the whole time. I'm like, oh yeah. my God, what's yeah. going on? Right. And so like, it's kind of having that too, but you know, and like, I, I guess part of it, maybe I'll ask you this too. Um, there is like maybe a little bit of fear to be vulnerable to, to some in that situation. Right. I didn't want to like show like, oh my God, I don't know what's going to happen to my, right. to my six year old. Right. right? But like, how do you kind of weight that, right? When sometimes we do have to face that fear, but also we have to show strength um, to not necessarily maybe cause a panic in some situations, even in, you know, in education too. How, right. how do you do, how do you kind of balance those two? Yeah, it's cer- it certainly is a balancing act. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I think the best way to really show up as a vulnerable leader um, is also your people are looking to you as a leader to, to, um, be willing to cast a vision that is bold, um, that is um, progressive, that is aspirational, right? So they want to know that you're heading somewhere, right? Like we don't want to we don't want to send this message that we're kind of out here floating around, because this can lead to apathy, complacency, can lead to kind of some fear too, right? Some mistrust of like, but where are we headed? And that leads to kind of cultures I don't think any of us want to be a part of, right? Where right. we're kind of all moving in different directions, right? So I think it's really and to bring back that word of courage, I think it's it's really this idea of standing courage and saying like, here's the vision and here's kind of all the voices we're hearing that make up this, uh, that make up this collective vision. And guys, we got to get there for kids. Like we've got to get there for kids. We've got to get there for our educators that keep choosing this field. And we want them to keep choosing this field. So it's this idea of, and sometimes the courage comes in, not everybody in the room may want to hear that. Right. Right. So even as hard as we try to seek consensus and we try to seek the shared voices of many, sometimes as leaders, we are called to step in and say, here's the data we're seeing. Here are the voices we're hearing, like from our most valued customers in education, which are our students. So we've got to make some shifts that can be scary. I'm going to be vulnerable enough and say, I don't have all the answers to get there. But we're going to, I'm going to be, you know, a courageous leader and say, but we have to get there. So what's the best first step, right? right. So certainly that, that, that balancing act of, uh, of knowing and, and, and really expecting that our folks that we serve should expect that we uh, have a North star, if you will, that we, that, that we have an aligned compass moving in a similar direction. And it's one that you as a leader are passionate and convicted on. Well, there, there's so many things that I want to kind of build on what you're talking about, because you're talking about that that vision of where we want to go, but also that we don't know all the answers. And I actually distinctly remember um, when I became a principal, I had the opportunity to hire my own assistant principal. And the person that I hired was actually a teacher on my staff, where I was assistant principal, who her and I did not always get along. We yeah. actually had some conflicts, but I also knew she wanted what's best for kids. And so did I, I knew that that was one thing I could never question with her. Right. But we had some different viewpoints and honestly, we had some different talents. We had different approaches, which is why I hired her. The reason I hired her was I I didn't need another George on staff because I already had George, right? That was me. I needed someone who thought different. And I think sometimes it kind of threw some of my staff off because they would say like, Hey, George, we're dealing with this thing. Uh, what do you think? I'm like, Oh no, that's a Cheryl question. And it's like, how is you as the boss yeah. are now deferring, you know, saying like, I'm not the expert and actually, you know, I'm like, well, that's why I hired, that's why yeah. I hired her because I, I don't know that stuff. I need her yeah. to actually do this. Right. And so I think the connection of what you're talking about is really important is that we did have that vision. We, we, we like 
we we made sure before we worked together that we were like aligned to where we wanted to go but right. we also knew that we had um different parts in that process right and you know i'm a big basketball guy i talk about basketball all the time uh, mm -hmm. it's one of my favorite things about phil jackson was that he he made sure that every person on that team that when he coached chicago bulls with michael jordan who's you know who is my opinion the greatest basketball player ever and like even if you don't know basketball you know who michael jordan is that's sure. how good he was but he didn't win any championships without phil jackson and the thing that phil jackson did really well was he made sure every person had a part in that shared vision as opposed to like hey just get on you know just do what michael jordan tells you to do kind of thing right, right. and like we all have different strengths even if you don't play your job is to push Michael Jordan as hard in practice as possible, right? But we're all towards that one goal of what we have. Yep. And so how do you, how do you like kind of, you know, in your role of like, you know, looking for principals, looking for staff mm -hmm. and leadership development, how do you actually develop people um, to em embrace that? Because for some people, the, the, um, there, there is a concern that, well, I don't want someone to see me not as the expert. Like, how do you, how do you round, like get people to kind of embrace that when it, there is a fear of, well, if I look like I'm, if I don't have the knowledge and stuff that maybe get, makes me lack credibility. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, honestly, some of that work has started. Um, we kind of meet as a district leadership team together. And some of that work started a few years ago, really looking at the job description of kind of a reimagined leader in public education, mm -hmm. right? And really getting clear about uh, the fact that you know, none of us are here because we all had the answers, right? So we didn't hire you. Upon hire, we did not expect that you had the knowledge and skills. However, we did expect that you're a good listener, right? That yeah. you're able to cast and communicate vision alongside a team. We do expect that you have humility and courage, right? So really naming and getting clear about these leadership traits that we value. And so almost giving our principals and our assistant principals this permission to not always know, right? Mm -hmm. To not always know. And then the other side of that is, okay, but some of the skills that are necessary, because right, like if we say knowledge and skills are valuable, but we're not saying you alone have to possess them, right? So are you skilled in facilitating conversations where we can like cast vision together, right? Are you are you skilled in effective collaboration and, and communication and crucial conversations that you're willing to step in because you have such a passion around this aligned vision and mission that is moving your community and students forward, right? Are you willing to hear feedback that you haven't always wanted to hear, right? How do you receive feedback in emotionally healthy ways, right? Um, how do you give feedback um, in ways that others can receive it um, in a healthy way, right? So I think it was a total, and, and we're, we're, we're still working on this, Georgia. I think personally, we're still working on this, right? Is how, what does leadership really mean to me, right? Because really, if we make some connections to that in the classroom, and a lot of the work we're working at, um, on here and here in Friendswood is this idea of educating students in the age of information, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, we could ask a lot of students to name the first four presidents and right. they may not know. We can, they can pull up their phones, their iPads, any other, any other source and find that in just a few minutes, right? And so it's this idea of, so if we value this about leadership 20 years ago, what is it that we value now and how do we support right. our leaders and making some of those steps in that direction? Well, they, they, it is interesting because there is this kind of pushback on uh, like, oh, we can just Google that. And people are like, well, you should know basic facts, all this other stuff. And it's like, yeah, like I actually do agree you should know basic facts, but it's actually how do you go beyond these things, right? Yeah. And that's like one of the things that we have to have conversations about uh, yeah. to kind of really give, uh, you know, kind of credence to what you were just talking about and how important that is to be able to like allocate and build leadership within your communities. Uh, when I was a teacher, uh, uh, on a staff, my principal, her name was Kelly Wilkins. And I have talked about Kelly over and over again. She's by far the biggest influence ever in my career. And she actually had me um, basically lead in education technology as a teacher, right? So I wasn't like given an admin role or anything like that. It was like, hey, this is kind of part of your, uh, you know, you're going to have a little bit of time allocated. And I remember her, um, her pulling me into the office one day and said, hey, so um, you've been here for about eight months and uh, we're figuring out our budget on what stuff we're going to buy for technology this year. And what, 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 what do you, how should we spend it? And I'm like, well, that's not my job. <laughs> like you're the principal. Like I don't want, uh, and she's like, well, that's why we hired you. We hired you because I don't know this stuff. And 
yeah, I, that was like, so even though I had done that role in other, uh, yeah. you know, other schools, it was the first time I was actually asked for input. Basically, it was always like the IT department or someone else just said, here's your stuff, figure it out. Yeah. Whereas now all of a sudden I was being asked for my feed. Like it wasn't even like give my feedback. It's like you're in, you're basically now making the call for the entire school. Yeah. So now all of a sudden I actually care about this way more because I know if I make the wrong decisions and I do something very, um, you know, for George, as opposed for yeah. the school, I'm going to hear about it from my colleagues. Right. That's Cause true. I like, I'd hear about them complaining about it. And what was interesting is that she had this way of really authentically, not like, cause I think sometimes people give ownership, mm -hmm. but they don't really give you ownership. Like right. they pretend they do. But yeah. it was like, you're going to make the decision. You're going to be held accountable by your colleagues, right? On whether we made the right decision or not. So it made me think a lot different. But then I had, like, it actually gave me a certain pride in the, right. the how the entire school did, as opposed to just the kids that I taught that year. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And so it, that was something that was, I really admire about her because... I feel when you have ownership over the the direction of the entire school, no matter your role, you have more pride in the school. That's the same with thing with kids, right? right? And how you actually how you connect that. Yes. Um, I, I do got to ask you this question. So I'm curious about this. Uh, I know in Friendswood, you live basically uh, <laughs> like NASA is there, right? Like, right. is that correct? Yeah. So sure. part of it too is like you have um, very academically gifted community. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. And so, and so I, I'm assuming if you look at scores, your scores are probably traditionally have always been good in Friendswood. You know, like not for every kid, but like if you took sure. it, like they're going to be higher level, et cetera, right? Yes. So one of the things I've I've always talked about is that um, one of the hardest things to challenge is success. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that it can be hard to get people to change um, you know, embrace new ways of teaching and learning when the traditional metrics are at a high level, right? right? So like, well, our scores are good. So why do we need to change anything? How, how, how have you kind of like, how do you, how do you deal with that? And maybe, and maybe you don't, maybe you're like, no, we're like, we don't need to change anything. So like, how do you deal with that when it's like, why would we need to change anything? Our scores are good. Like right. how have you dealt with that? That's a great question, George. And, and really, it, in fact, it's one that we're living uh, currently. We're in year five of our strategic plan in Friendswood. And one of one of the goals within that plan, in fact, the plan was developed before I was here, but I'm fortunate to be here to help um, our community and um, our teams bring this to life. But one of the goals is we will redefine the measure of student success, right? And so for me, most focused on serving our kindergarten through fifth grade. So I'll just kind of share some of these examples. So the conversation started around what does it mean to redefine success for a five-year-old, for an eight-year-old, for an 11-year-old? As you mentioned, George, you could pull up our, you know, our state test scores called the STAR test, you know, here, here in Texas. And really, if you look at the all-student kind of summary, you'd think, man, they got it going on, right? right. And so, um, so fortunate that through that strategic plan, our district chose to involve kind of student voices, right? And really, what does it mean to redefine success? And, and really, can you quantify this really complex um, uh, idea of teaching and learning within a number grade, right? Like, does it, what does an 82 really tell you about George, right? Uh, what does this really mean? And really this idea of um, if we want to see instructional shifts, shifts, if we want to see students really having, you know, voice and choice in their learning, if we want to see students taking more ownership of their learning, if we want to see students evaluating and tracking it and, and setting their own goals, what are the barriers to that work? Right. And so really where we landed in Friends with ISD is some of those barriers really have to do with kind of our current grading practices. Right. Like this idea of grades equate success, mm -hmm. a 92 right. is successful. And so really doing um, a lot of work um, around this idea of getting rid of just like this holistic average and really breaking down students learning so that they can understand it and so that they can own it. Right. And so it's been an incredibly fun process with lots of lots of voice um, and lots of involvement. It's it's a big shift for our community. It's it's a right. big shift for ourselves. It's it's a big shift for students. Um, but gosh, one that is so worth taking, a, a truly one that is so worth taking. Um, we also have a goal in our strategic plan that's really centered around kind of personalized and authentic learning experiences. And, and really, this gives us a chance to reimagine um, what education can look like. And 
Honestly, George, I, I was watching uh, a TED Talk. Uh, the guy's name, I believe, was Jim McManus and really just kind of honing my skills on how, how do I make sure that I'm hearing all that feedback from our community and how do I continue to speak to that and really, really value our parents as partners and value our teachers as partners, our students as partners in this work. And he says, you got to get clear about your metaphor. So I was thinking, George, how do we, like for me, can we move the metaphor from like these factory lines, like these assembly lines of learning where students are considered to be these empty vessels that we're filling up so like this idea of like a research lab, right? right. Uh, and still even working on like, what are some metaphors? Like, and I think people are drawn to kind of like these visual images that they can create, but gosh, what is the new metaphor that we can paint for our community to really begin to reimagine instructional opportunities for kids? Yeah. And it, like, I, I, one of the things when you talk about grades specifically, uh, there is this, there is this belief that our communities also value grades. And then if you actually put it to the test, a lot of people that own businesses, uh, you know, even people that are working in education, like I hired teachers, never looked at their grades, had no concern. In fact, I actually could tell you some of the worst students were some of the best teachers I ever had. Absolutely. Uh, and so like people, once we start realizing this, and I remember actually um, in, in kind of talking about how we bring people together, I think, I think we discount that a lot more people are kind of see this vision and want to see education a different way, but we sometimes use another group as kind of like the reason we're not moving forward. So I'll give you an example. I was, I was actually at this school district. I'll never forget this. And in the morning I spoke to teaching staff and that this is how they set up the day. So I talked to teaching staff and I remember we were getting conversations mm -hmm. And they were like, George, we love the stuff you're talking about. Like, we so appreciate it. It's our men. They're holding us back. Like, we want to do this, but our men is holding us back. Yep. So then afternoon, you already know where I was going. I talked to the men. Oh, mm. we are so in line. I'm doing the same talk, right? Yes. We're so in line with what you're saying. It's our teachers. Yep. They don't want to do this, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so I talked to them. And then, and then at night, I spoke to the parents parents oh we love this stuff our men are teachers they don't want to do this with kids i'm like have you talked to each other <laughs> like have you have you ever talked to each other because it's kind of interesting because you all seem to want the same thing but you're all blaming the other person for not yeah. moving forward right because yes. i think a lot of times we kind of discount oh that's what parents want or that's what teachers want or that's what admin wants but then right. if you actually get into the same room i think a lot of people understand there is a a new vision of how we could actually you know, right. really kind of like, you know, and the thing I always say is I don't care if kids go to college. My, my, my goal is to help every child find a pathway to success that is meaningful right. to them. Right. right. Now, if college is one of those pathways. Great. great. But mm -hmm. I also don't want to discount, you know, like this opportunity, like what if, what if my kid wants to say, you know what, I don't want to go to college. I want to be a famous podcaster. Do sure. I just say, no, you have to do these things first. No, yeah. it's like, take that opportunity. Right. College will always be there, right? That will always be there. It's only going to get more expensive, as you know. Can't yeah. imagine what's going to cost by the time my kids oh my you gosh. Know, get to be yeah. that age. Mm -hmm. But you know, it is going to kind of challenge those things. So, like, how how have you? And I know you've done some of this work. Sure. How have you actually brought the communities to get like you know yeah. different aspects of your community together to have some of those conversations? Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mentioned the strategic plan that was five years ago, and that that particular group was comprised of um, many stakeholders, you know, parents, community members, business partners, students, which I love, you know, admin, teachers. And so really from that five year plan, kind of when I entered this work, um, probably probably some of the highlights of my career are we kind of like really zoomed in on this idea of redefining the measure of student success, right? So we didn't start out doing this thing. Like we're going to do the right. standard-based learning and grading thing, right? Because right. no programs and things don't really get us anywhere. It's the hearts of people, right? And so from that was really able to say, okay, like what's the subcommittee that we could form comprised of many voices, thoughts, and perspectives, right? That we could gather together to really begin to shape, like what does it mean, again, to redefine success for our youngest learners? And so again, comprised of, you know, parents, um, community members, 
board members. Uh, we were bringing forward the voices of third graders and fifth graders. We actually even had students present at our board meeting and really share their journey. We piloted this work a little bit in second grade last year here in Friendswood. So um, anyway, that's been incredibly valuable. Um, even, even a cool activity like starting with our community and saying, okay, you now own a business. You have six openings. Like you, you get to hire six people. You got Lauren, 92, George, 64. Sorry, George. You know, Bobby, a 71, right? And so who would you hire? And it's right. been really cool because some of these, you know, some of these business partners and parents are like, I need more information. I need more information. Exactly. It's like, exactly. So helping to make these relevant connections for our community and for our parents and, and really not seeing feedback or not seeing questions as negatives, right? I think everybody deserves the right to sit in the learner seat, to sit in the learner seat. Everybody deserves the right to be afraid at first, right? Some of us express fear in different ways, but man, it's our job as leaders to recognize that and name that it's new and it's different. And I think we have an obligation um, as public educators to continue um, to really seek feedback and to explain and to share. And, you know, honestly, George, what's coming next, I'm super excited is I just want to break down the walls of public schools and get people in, get right. people in to see these kids. Because as much as um, we talk about, you know, some of these reforms, this is not really about grades. It's not a grading. It's not about swapping two numbers, right, for proficiency scales, for number of grades. I want them to see the instructional shifts happening. I want them to see a five-year-old talk about what they're proud of and their goals and to see that that's being driven by him and his peers, right? That teachers are really these facilitators and they're really almost just like watching these children advocate for their own learning. It's so that's, I'm excited to begin to break down the walls and to get some of our, we kind of have a vision for teaching and learning advisory groups to begin to come in and, and really share and allow our principals to really highlight and, and really spotlight and showcase their teachers and students. I'm pretty pumped about it. Well, the, the, the nice thing when you, when you, one thing I've always like dreamt of for, just basically education is that a lot of times we refer to like Google or Microsoft or Amazon. We'll talk about some of the practices and say like, hey, how does that apply to education? But the reality of it is people outside of education should be looking at how people learn. Because if you have a business, an organization, and you don't actually have people that have the ability to learn and adapt, then you're not going to be in business very long. And that is actually where schools come in, right? Is that, and I'm not just talking about how are we developing kids to actually be those learners, to actually you know embrace new ideas and learn whatever comes their way, but also how do organizations outside come into schools, see how we're doing this and develop and learn from educators yeah. on how you actually yeah. help people embrace those practices. Uh, one of the things that I distinctly remember about being at Friendswood, and it's just kind of showing how you're living what you're talking about, it wasn't, I wasn't just talking to your teaching staff, Right. Yeah. I was talking to all of your staff. I was talking to um, parents were there. I remember mm -hmm. that distinctly because yeah. many of them actually came up to me after and they're like, oh, we are like so on board. Yeah, our education and it was, parents. It was nice yeah. because they were all in the room. Yeah. Kids were actually there. And I remember actually this specifically. I had to pee so bad <laughs> before. And the only way to go to the bathroom was you had cheerleaders. Yes. That were cheering and screaming for anybody that went through. <laughs> Walking back and forth. <laughs> and I had to go through them and they were like cheering me, not yeah. knowing that they were cheering me to go pee. Like <laughs> I had to go so bad. I'm like, oh my God, like this is so like I'm like and I'm like, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I just want to go to the bathroom. I just where's the bathroom? Where's the bathroom? <laughs> and so so it was like it was really cool. I think that, you know, um there there's something for me at Texas and uh what you're doing at Friendswood the way that you do those opening days and you bring people together and there's such a pride uh, in your community working together towards something to help, yes. you know, to serve students, as you know, you'd say, uh, it was really admirable. So it, it was awesome to talk to you today, Lauren, and uh, please give my best to everyone in Friendswood. And uh, anyone that's listening, make sure that you check the link below to Lauren's blog. I know she does some really incredible writing and uh, I know, um, she's continuing to do that. And I, I just love the stuff that you're sharing with the world and what you're learning, you know, in your role. So Lauren, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me on. Good to be with you guys. Thanks everyone for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day.